Alright, so we're continuing on with our study in uh, the book of Matthew. We're in Matthew chapter 3. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of great doctrine, a lot of great things we can learn from Matthew chapter 3. You know, we could learn, you know, how that salvation is by grace. There's a lot of great um, verses in that, the doctrine that's taught there, that God is no respecter of persons. That's something else we can learn from this chapter. We can learn about baptism from this chapter. We can learn about the triune nature of God. This chapter. So the book of Matthew is just a very rich book, you know, as, as all the books of the Bible are. And they're just packed. Some, some chapters just seem like they're more packed with, with just good doctrine than others. And, uh, you know, they're, they're just covering a broader uh, uh, spectrum of, of, of doctrines. You know, some chapters tend to focus in on one particular doctrine. And the book of Matthew, this chapter 3, just seems to kind of cover a gamut of, of different doctrines. And We'll do our best this evening to kind of get through every verse. You know, the, the goal always when we're preaching on, on Thursday nights is to go verse by verse. Now, obviously, you know, some verses we're going to kind of gloss over, or you know, they're just kind of uh, we're going to we're going to go over them quickly and spend more time on others. But getting right into it, we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter three, uh, verse one. It says, "In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand." Now, what I love about this verse right here is it starts out with John the Baptist. That's B-A-P-T-I-S-T, Baptist, right? Amen. I always like I like to point that out. Sometimes I'll be out knocking on the door and you'll run into the, the hmm. Catholic or somebody like that who's just, you know, they're very polite and kind, but they're also very smug. I've run into this a few times where they say, well, you know, all the Protestants, they all came out from us. You know, they think that they're just the original church and that, that, we're, that somehow we're just birthed from them, that they're our mother. You know that we we owe our you know existence to the fact that the Catholic Church is around. But what is you know I always like to point that out. Well, you know and they'll say, well we trace our our, our our ourselves back all the way back to the apostles, and they'll say, well we go all the way back to Jesus Christ. Well, you know we go all the way back to the guy that baptized Jesus. We go all back. You know you won't see John the Catholic. You won't see John the Lutheran. You're not going to see John the Episcopalian. But you know what you will find is John the Baptist. Amen. So you know don't ever be ashamed of the fact that you take on the title Baptist. That's a great. Uh, that's a badge of honor. That's something to wear, you know, uh, and try to live up to. That's something that we should try to emulate John in. We should try to be a Baptist as John was a Baptist. And what were some of the things about John that we should try to emulate in our own lives as Baptists? It says there that he was preaching. You know, that's one big thing. That's a that's a big part of what who we are as Baptists is the preaching of the word. You know, we don't not going to get up and preach these motivational speeches, these feel good messages. You know, just try and you know, scratch your back and tickle your ear and just make you feel good. No, he was a preacher. He was a hard preacher. He preached some hard things, as we'll see tonight in the in this sermon. Also, he was preaching where? He was preaching in the wilderness. You know, we as Baptists, you know, we're not exactly the most popular or sought out group of people. You know, especially as independent fundamental Baptists. You know, especially people who hold to certain core doctrines, what they believe. We're not, you know, people who tend to get up and really let her, you know, rip face as we ought to and, and call out sin and and preach hard, you know. For that type of person, we're not going to draw the biggest crowd. You know, we're going to be out in the wilderness. We're people who are going to want to find us and be a part of that kind of a church. They're going to have to go out of their way. You know, we're not going to be just you know the, the mega church that's on every corner that's that that we see today. Yeah. And what was he doing? What was the type of preaching that John the Baptist had? Well, it says there in verse verse three that he was crying in the wilderness. He was crying out there. That was the type of preaching that John the Baptist had. And we as preachers are those who would get up behind a pulpit and preach God's word, there should be, you know, we should never shy away from crying or lifting up our voice. The Bible says, you know, when, what does it say they're crying? It doesn't mean he was weeping. It doesn't mean that her tears were coming down his eyes. It means that he was lifting up his voice, that he was trying to be heard, that he was saying something, you know, very emphatically, that he was trying to make sure people could hear what he had to say and take note. It says in Isaiah 58, 1, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgressions in the house of Jacob their sins. You know, I always kind of chuckle. I'm thinking about a lady we were out door knocking just a few weeks ago. I told her I was, we were from a Baptist church. And she said, oh, I don't like to be preached at. And, you know, and I was like, well, I kind of, I said, okay, well, you have a nice day. That's, I was nice. I didn't get rude. But I walked away thinking to myself, well, hey, at least we're known as Baptists as people who will preach at you. Amen. You know, I'm not going to be ashamed of that. At least she knew that, hey, this is a Baptist church. There's preaching going on there. She doesn't want to get preached at. Well, you know what? Maybe you shouldn't come here then. Because that's what goes on in a Baptist church. That's who John the Baptist was. He was one who was out in the wilderness, lifting up his voice like a trumpet, crying and preaching the word. <clears throat> you know, verse 4 shows us another thing about John the Baptist. It shows us there in verse 4, it says, And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair 
and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Now compare that picture that, that you get in your mind when you read those verses of a guy with a, with a raiment of camel's hair. You know, that, I can't imagine that. That's, you know, if anyone has ever touched you know, many fur, you know, have you ever felt like a mink coat? That's a very soft fur. I mean, that's very nice to put on. I mean, that's a very expensive coat. I can't imagine that. I've ridden a camel at, at the Phoenix Zoo. That's not exactly mink. That, that's pretty rough. That's some rough hair. Now that, John wasn't put that on there because he was trying to walk around and, and be a part of high society. You know, he wasn't stepping out of the limo with his camel hair on, you know, and, and everyone was ooing and on and someone's throwing paint on it saying, you know, fur is murder, you know. <laughs> they weren't doing that. He was putting that on because, you know, that, that was what he had. That was a pretty rough garment. <clears throat> what else does it say about him? He had a leathern girdle about his loins. Say he was a man, you know, he could put on the belt and he could hold his pants up where they belong. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And his meat was locusts and wild honey. You know, he I mean locusts, that's like grasshoppers, right? He's out eating insects, and he's going into the beehive and he's pulling out the honey and eating it, you know, getting stung. I and mean, this is a tough guy. This is a rough person. And he was a Baptist. You know, and I mean compare that picture to the to the, the guy you see today in the most and even even in, in so called, you know, independent Baptist churches. Yeah. They're getting up, you know, at the at the local, you know, like this pastor polka dot up there in Tempe that's meeting at the the comedy hour bar or whatever. It's a, literally a bar where comedians come on stage and tell the filthiest jokes, probably even blaspheme the name of our Lord. And he's kind of following them up on Sunday, you know, with his skinny jeans and his polka dot shirt and his, you know, you, that's not John the Baptist style preaching. And here here we have an example of a Baptist as somebody who's rough. You know, who isn't worried about being in fashion, who isn't trying to go along with, you know, the latest trends. He's just worried about lifting up his voice and being heard. And that's, and we as Baptists, that's how we ought to try and be. It's like John the Baptist. Amen. The Bible says, I mean, this is a guy who, I mean, think about him living and dwelling in the wilderness until the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ, eating the insects, eating the honey, wearing the leather, wearing the camel's hair. I mean, rough guy, yeah. right? He endured some hardness. I mean, he showed us an example that if we're as Baptists, sometimes there might be seasons in our life where we, we should be willing to endure some difficult times, some hardness to go without. That's why the Bible says in 2 Timothy, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You know, when you sign up to be a Baptist and you sign up to serve God, you know, you're signing up for a battle. And you can't be, you can't be soft, you can't be weak. You've got to have some grit. You've got to be willing to be like a soldier. You know, imagine being a soldier and going to the army and, and, and not being willing to crawl through the mud or being afraid of the barbed wire. I can't crawl into that. I might get cut. I mean, they're going to boot you. You're done. You're going to get a dishonorable discharge. You know, or I'm afraid of guns. I mean, that, that would be ridiculous, right? Well, what's, what is it with Christians who say they want to serve God and then when the, when, the, when the battle comes on, when it gets a little hot, they just, they just back out. You know, they get weak or they, they just wilt. And they just say, well, you know, I just... I'm, I'm too nice. I'm too loving. I'm too kind. I just think you're being too harsh. The preachers, the preaching's a little too hard. You know, the, we're to be, we're to endure hardness. We're to endure the persecution that might come because of the preaching of the word of God. <clears throat> Goes on there, and we'll move on again in verse two, where it says, "And saying, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand." Now that was John the Baptist's message, wasn't it? He said, "Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand." Now, verse 2 is something to take note of because it's often quoted by those that would preach a repent of your sins gospel. Yeah. What I mean by that is that somebody that would say, hey, you know, if in order for you to be saved, in order for you to go to heaven, you have to repent of your sin. And what they mean by that in most cases is that you have to stop sinning in your life. That if there's some sin in your life that if you want to get saved, you have to stop doing that. Or they'll say, or you at least have to be willing to turn from that. Now, we do not believe that here. We believe that salvation is by grace, through faith, and not of works. Amen. And we're going to look at this for a minute and prove that this doctrine of believing that you have to repent of your sin is a works-based salvation. It is a backdoor to lordship and salvation. And that's what it is. <clears throat> but they'll often quote John. They'll say, or they'll quote, you know, John the Baptist. They'll quote Jesus Christ. They'll, post, they'll quote the Apostle Peter, the Apostle Paul. They'll say, well, all these guys preached repentance, and we're not arguing that. We're not saying that no one preached repentance. We're saying that the people who think they add on those magic words, repent of your sins, they didn't preach that. We're all for repentance in context, as it is taught in Scripture. 
I mean, repenting is a good of sin is a good thing to do, is it not? Amen. Isn't that something we should try to do as Christians to repent? Yeah. Is that what we have to do to go to heaven, though? No. We're, but people think we're just saying that you can just you know live however you want with no consequences. That's not what we're saying. We're saying you can live however you want, and if your faith, however great or small, is all on the Lord Jesus Christ and His shed blood, His death, His burial, and resurrection, you can go to heaven without having to turn from your drunkenness, without having to turn from your fornication. Now, should you quit being a drunk? Should you quit being a fornicator? Absolutely. These are things that the Bible condemns. But those are not. that's not something you have to do in order to be saved. <clears throat> God often commands His people to repent throughout Scripture. We see that. And in fact, God repents more than anybody else in Scripture. If you go back and look up the word repent, it's God that we see repenting. So, therefore, right, right there we know that repent cannot mean turn from sin. Yeah. Because if you're going to say that, then you have to say mm. that God turns from sin more than anybody else. That somehow God is a sinner. And people say, well, that, that, you know, you're, you're twisting our words. That's not what we meant. No, that's what you're saying. When you're saying repent means turn from sin. You can't say that because of the fact that God repents more than anybody else in Scripture. You see, repenting is not necessary for salvation. If it was, if it was necessary for a person to turn from their sin to be saved, it would contradict clear Scripture. It would contradict, contradict clear Scripture. Now, <clears throat> go ahead and keep it. Of course, keep a place in Matthew 3. We'll be back and forth all night. But go ahead and, not all night, just a little while. But go ahead and just turn over to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. John chapter 20. I'll start reading in verse 30 of John chapter 20, verse 3. The Bible says in John 20, and many, verse 30, and many other signs did Jesus in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that believing you might have life through His name. Now notice there it says that Jesus could have written, what the Bible is saying here in the verse is that John could have written of many other things, right? He says there in verse 30, and many other signs truly did Jesus. He's saying, look, there's many other things I could have written about Jesus. There's many other signs that He did. He's saying there's so much more we could have talked about regarding our Lord. He's saying we could have wrote of all these other things. But instead, He still goes on and says, which, they says, which are not written in this book, but these are written. He's saying this was the reason why these things are written. What's the reason that instead of writing about all these other things that Jesus did, that He chose to write about these things that He wrote about? That He might believe, and that believing He might have life through His name. He's saying, look, I wrote these things in this book that ye might believe, and that, and, that, and that believing you might have life through His name. The book of John is written for the express person, per, purpose of a person knowing what it takes to be saved. That you can read the book of John and, and know what salvation is all about. That it's by belief. I mean, just go through the book of John in your Bible reading, and every time the word believe, believeth, believed, comes up, believing, highlighted. Friend, it'll come up multiple times. I looked up just the word believe, and I think it comes up twice as much as any other gospel. Just believe, believe. And remember, why? Why is it written that way? Why is the word believed used so much in the book of John? Because these things are written that you might believe, and that believing you might have life through his name, not through your works, not through your returning from your sin, that you might believe, and that you might have faith in his, in his name. Amen. You know what word isn't mentioned one time in the book of John? Repent. Yeah. I mean, if there's a book that's expressly written for the purpose of teaching you how, what it takes to go to heaven, that you might have life through His name, and it left out the, it left out all this doctrine of repenting your sin, John really missed the boat. He really messed up. You know, and I've explained that to people in the past, and they say that's deceptive. You know, well, you, you know what? That's a deceptive way to look at the Scripture. You, you know, you have, to read the, you have to read in the context of all the other Scriptures. Well, you know what? Take it up with John. Because John's the one who wrote that book, and he said that he could have written many other things, and he took the time to write about these things, that you might believe, and you might have life through his name, by believing. That's the reason why this book's written. And if, you don't, if that rubs people the wrong way, that's just too bad for them. They don't get it then. But it would contradict clear Scripture, wouldn't it, to sit here and say that you have to turn from your sins to be saved. We all know Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. 
Not of works. I mean, God's just repeating himself. It's by grace. It's not of works. It's not of yourselves. Let's say man should boast. Isn't it funny? These guys that preach this doctrine of repenting of your sins, they love to boast. They love to tell you how when they got saved, they quit their drinking and they don't even desire a drop of alcohol and they quit their smoking and they quit their running around and they quit all these other things and how they just quit all their sin and how they just got the sin out of their life. You know, they quit going to the bar and that's how they know they're saved. Well, I, I know I'm saved because I put my faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Not because I turned from my sin. It would contradict contradict clear scripture to say that because <clears throat> we know salvation is not by works repenting as defined by our detractors is a work according to scriptures when people go ahead and turn over to Jonah chapter 3 Jonah chapter 3 see when they're saying repent they're saying you need to repent they're saying you need to turn from your sin you need to quit doing all these bad things in your life you need to quit the smoking you need to quit the drink you, you name the sin they want you to quit it if you want to go to heaven. That's what they mean when they say repent. Okay? That's what they mean. So if we're to take their definition of repentance and compare it with Scripture, we'll find that it's defined as works, clearly in Scripture. And I love this verse that we're going to look at. Because this verse, I, I know a person who purposely skipped over the book of Jonah. I heard a pastor get up and say, well, you'll never find the word repentance in the book of Jonah. Well, you'll find the word repent. And it's pretty interesting how it's used. And it's pretty interesting that a man would get up who preaches repenting your sin salvation and tell you you won't find the word repent in a book that defines it as works. It's not a coincidence that a person would say such a thing. We'll begin in verse 4 where it says, And Jonah, began, if you know the story of Jonah, he's told to go to Nineveh. And to tell them that God's going to destroy the city. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey and cried, kind of like John the Baptist, right? And cried and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So shall the people of Nineveh believe. And so the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. Now notice here, it says that they believed God. They believed God. And then they proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest, even the least of them. They believe God. <laughs> they acted on faith by believing the preaching of, of Jonah. <laughs> but notice, they'll say, well, yeah, they believe God, but then they, they did these, they repented. So obviously you can see how, how it's part of it. No, it's two different things that they're doing there. They, yeah, they believe, but did they have to repent? Well, let's look at it. Verse 10. Where God calls their repentance works. And God saw their, what did he say? Works. God saw their works. What was their works? When they proclaimed a fast, when they put on sackcloth from the greatest even the least of them. He saw their works that they turned from their evil way. When they turned from their sin. It's a work, my friend. And God repented. Oh, and who's doing the repenting here? God. God repented of the evil that he said he would have, oh, that that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Look, friend, if you're going to sit there and tell me that you have to repent of your sins and be saved, I'm going to say that you're not saved. Amen. If you're going to preach that, I'm going to say, you know what? You don't even understand the gospel then. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, and you have to be careful not to just label every guy that says that as unsaved. Because I, I, I believe that has been preached before in the, in the repentant, repent of your sins spectrum disorder. You know, where some people are saying it, they don't even understand what they're saying it. They're just repeating what they've heard. Yeah. They're just repeating what their Bible college is telling them to say. They're just repeating what their favorite Bible teacher is saying. And they're not even really thinking about what they're saying. And then when someone shows them, hey, look what Jonah 3.10 says. Hey, is there, look what the fact that God, John didn't even talk about it. Look, just you know, think for a minute about the scripture you do know that it's by grace through faith and not of works. And how repenting your, and they'll go, oh, I get it. So you'll have that guy who will, who will say that. You've got to repent of your sins. And if you correct him on it, he'll say, you know what? You're right. And there have been preachers like that. Great men of God that have, have, have come around and are much more careful today to not just say that. But then there's the other guy who's way at the other end, who absolutely 100% believes that if you haven't turned from your sin, you're not saved. There's a guy who will say, you know, you know, I was going to give the guy the gospel, but he wouldn't give up his drinking. Yeah. 
That's wicked, friend. That's not even the gospel then. Then you don't even know the good news. Anyone who would say that probably isn't even saved themselves. Yeah. You know, and this is really something that deserves a whole sermon in and of itself. And we will talk a little bit more about it as we get further into the chapter. But we're going to move on to back in uh, Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. It says in Matthew chapter 3, beginning in verse 2, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Verse 3, For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. What's great about John is that he is somebody who was prophesied about in the Old Testament multiple times. Multiple times. If you would turn over to Malachi chapter 3, this isn't necessarily something that's um, really deep, but it's, it's something that I found very interesting. You know, this is just kind of one of those kind of things you find in the Bible when I'm, you kind of think, well, that's interesting. So I thought I'd point it out. But John was prophesied in the Old Testament. It says in Isaiah 40, you're turning over to Malachi 3, but it says in Isaiah 40, the voice of him crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight uh, in, the, in the desert a highway for our God. So they're saying, look, there's going to be a messenger that's sent before his face. This is his, this is his message. We see the things that are said of John were quoted in the Old Testament. <clears throat> You're looking into Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord, whom ye shall seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. So, and of course, that's quoted in Matthew 11. You don't have to turn there. But what's interesting is that in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, Malachi chapter 3, chapter 3, verse 1, is where this is prophesied. And where is it fulfilled? Matthew 3, verse 1. So I thought that was interesting anyway. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to, it's not like Bible code or anything like that. I'm not going to start like, you know, if you take certain words, you know, like people just go off on this kind of thing. But I thought that was interesting. I mean, isn't that kind of interesting? You know, yeah, kind is. of a lighthearted thing. But it's interesting, the Word of God, that in the last book of the Old Testament, you have John the Baptist prophesied about his message in Matthew, Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. And in the first book of the New Testament, He's, he fulfills that prophecy in Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. Anyway, I thought that was interesting. Now notice though, in the, something else we can take from this is the fact that John was his purpose was to prepare the way. That's why he was there. It says, uh, the, uh, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And it was talked about in Isaiah chapter 40, prepare the, ye the way of the Lord. Malachi chapter 3, and he shall prepare the way before me. So that was John's purpose, was to prepare the way. And how did he kind of fulfill this? Well, one way he kind of fulfilled this, I believe, is that, first of all, he gathered the people into one place to behold Christ's baptism. I mean, it says they shall make a, you know, a desert and a, a straight, a desert and a highway. He shall make path, straight the paths of our God. So Jesus, when you think about it, he made a straight, he was made straight in the desert a highway for our God. You know, and there's probably other ways of interpreting this, but when I kind of first, you know, just... Uh, went over this, I kind of thought of the fact that you know, John prepared the way when he gathered all the people together because Jesus was able to go straight to that place in the desert. He didn't have to go around and gather people himself. He had, John had already prepared the way. He, there was one place that Jesus Christ had to come to in the desert, in the wilderness, and that people could behold his baptism. <clears throat> it's kind of further explained in the New Testament. Go ahead and uh, turn over to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. It says in Luke 1, I'll begin reading in verse 15, For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor stone drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. This is, of course, speaking of John the Baptist. Even from his mother's womb, verse 16, And many of the children of Israel shall turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before them in the spirit of the power of Elias, to turn the hearts of the father to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So the Bible showing us that John's purpose was to make a people prepared for the Lord. How did he do that? It says that he turned the people to the Lord their God. The turning to the Lord is the repentance that John preached. John definitely preached repentance, but what did that mean? It means that he, the, the repentance was that he was turning people to their God. I mean, that's what the word repent means. It means turn. You know, my wife likes to read some of these Jane, these old John, uh, Jane Austen novels sometimes. I mean, they're harmless. You know, they're just 
good, the kind of wholesome, more old-fashioned kind of, you know, things. And uh, she pointed out one time about how often the word repent was used. I mean, that's an old English word that people would use. It's probably not technically old English, but that's what they would use, you know, in, in days gone by. Repent was more commonly used. And repent simply means turn. That's all it means, to turn. That's why God can repent in the Bible as often He did, because it just means turn. That's why it says in Jeremiah chapter 4, For this shall the earth mourn, and the heavens be above be black, because I have spoken it, I have purposed it, and will not repent, neither will I turn back from it. So God's saying, I'm not going to repent. What does He mean? I will not turn back. Again, the Bible's defining for us what the word repent means. And Jonah, if you recall, it says, what, Who can tell if God will turn and repent? So the word, that's what it means. So what's John doing? He's preparing the people to meet their God, making them ready, preparing the people for the Lord. He's turning them to God. <clears throat> Go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. What he's doing is he's saying, look, don't follow. John is saying, you know, don't follow the, these vipers, this den of iniquity and the Pharisees and Sadducees that are trying to lay heavy burdens upon you and follow after some works-based salvation. He's trying to turn them to the living and true God the Christ, the Messiah. Acts chapter 26, verse 20. But showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God. That's, that is the repentance, that they need to turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Now Paul showed them two separate actions, didn't he? He said, turn to God and do works meet for repentance. He didn't say turn to God, repent, which is turning, which is doing works. No, he said repent, turn to God, and do works meet for repentance. That's the same message that John preached. That they should repent and do work means for, for repentance. Look at Acts 19, verse 4. Acts 19, verse 4. I'll begin reading in Acts 19, verse 4. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance. That was his baptism saying unto the people that they should believe on Him which should come after Him, that is, on Christ Jesus. So what is it when, when it says that John was preaching the repent, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand? What does he mean by that? Well, it tells us right here. It tells us that he was saying unto the people that they should believe on Him, that should come after Him. He's saying, don't not believe, turn, repent, I'm preparing you to believe on Him. That's the repentance that John preached. That they would believe. Not that they would turn from their sin. Matthew 21, I'll read for you. It says, Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, the publicans and the harlots, Go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. He's saying, look, when John was preaching, he's, and of course he's talking to the Pharisees, he said, when John was preaching in the wilderness... John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and you didn't believe what he had to say. You didn't believe on him that would come after him. You haven't believed on me, Christ is saying. And he's saying, but the publicans and the harlots, the people that were there, they believed him. They did believe. They turned unto their God. They believed. And when ye had seen it, repented not afterward. And what's the repentance? That ye might believe. They needed to repent and believe, not repent of their sin. Amen. Repent, turn to God, bring forth fruits, meet for repentance. That's what John preached there in Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance. He's saying, look... <laughs> If you guys believe, you know, bring forth fruits, meet for repentance. But we know that is that not a good thing to do? To bring forth work, works, meet for repentance? But did John say, you, need, you guys need to do this if you want to get saved? Is that what he told them? If you guys want to get saved, he's calling them vipers. He's calling them, you know, that they're, they're fleeing from the wrath to come. It's like John already knows that these guys are reprobate. That they're trying to flee from the wrath to come. And he's saying, you know what? Bring forth fruit meets for repentance. But we know that that, that can't mean that, they, that we need to turn from our sin to be saved. 
We know that can't mean that because that would contradict Scripture. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, again, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works. We should, when we get saved, we should do good works. We should bring forth fruit, meet for repentance. We should bring forth works in our lives that show that we have turned to our God. But must we? No, we should. We should. For we are His workmanship, created Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. He didn't say that we must walk in them. That if you don't walk in these good works, that if you don't bring forth these fruits, then you're not saved. And that's what a lot of people will say. They say, well, you'll know them by their fruits. But that's referring to the fact, that's referring to false prophets, people who teach a false gospel, that you will know them by your fruits. You can't look at a person and look at their life and tell whether or not they're saved. All you can believe is what a person says with their mouth. But that doesn't, but you know, we should bring forth good works. We should walk in the works God has foreordained for us to walk in. But must we? No. It's just something that we should do. Look at verse 11, Matthew 3, verse 11. He says in verse 3, chapter 3, excuse me, verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water and repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Verse 12, whose fan is in his hand, and he shall thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into his garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now, I kind of want to just look here, kind of moving on from what we've been talking about. But it says there that He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now there's two interpretations that, that I've heard. And, and the first one would be that when He's talking, what does He mean there? He says He shall baptize you with fire. Now I know of course that He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost talking about you know, Acts chapter 2 when, they're, when they're, the Holy Ghost comes upon them. You know, and this is the first interpretation which I'm not going to say is wrong. It very well could be right. It's not necessarily what I think that John is saying here. But it says in Acts chapter 2, go ahead and turn over to Acts chapter 2. They're saying, well, that bat when he says he's going to baptize them with fire, they're saying, well, that's a reference to the filling of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, which you find in Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Let's read that. This is what they're saying that John is referring to. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, Acts chapter 2, verse 1, they were all of one accord in one place, verse 2. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house. And they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So see, that's what John's referring to. Because you have the cloven tongues, that's the baptism of fire. Now, I'm not going to say that that's wrong. I'm just saying that's not how I interpret that. And I've heard, that, you know, this isn't something I came up with. I've heard other people, you know, teach this. This isn't, you know, new doctrine. I'm trying to, and quite frankly, it's very minuscule. It's not like a, a point of division. This isn't something we have to, you know, separate fellowship over. It's a, it's just one of those little minutiae in the Word of God. But interpretation two, which is what I tend to think, is that when He says that He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And with fire, that he's actually talking about the fact that he's going to baptize people in the lake of fire. That it's a reference to the fact that God is going to send some people to hell. You see, you've got to remember when you read this verse in John chapter 3, that he's speaking to two groups of people. Right? The Pharisees and the Sadducees that showed up, where he rebuked them. He said, you, ver you vipers who have born you to flee from the wrath to come. So he's talking to two, type, two people. And he's talking about those that believe as well as those, who, as those who do not, which would be the Pharisees. And those people who do not believe, we all know Revelation chapter 20, verse 15, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, if you're cast into a lake, you're going to kaboom, you're going to be baptized, aren't you? That's what baptism is, full immersion. You're going to go down into that lake. You're going to be surrounded in flame. <clears throat> so that's what I believe he's referring to. And further, the other reason why I think this is that Matthew chapter 12 is a continuation of the same thought in verse 11 that shows the two groups of people yet again. It emphasizes the fact that it's two groups of people. Because if you read there, Matthew 11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Colon, there's not a period there. The thought continues in verse 12. 
whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor. He shall gather his wheat into his garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Yeah. So another reference to fire, another reference to people being separated. Right? So that's why I, I tend to think that when he says the fire there, he's actually talking about the fact that some people are going to be cast into hell. Now, if you don't subscribe to that, we can still be friends. We can still go to church. We can still have fellowship. Right? Isn't that wonderful? <clears throat> Let's move on, though. Again, just a minor point in the Scripture. The Bible says there, and we're going to go ahead and read the Christ's example of baptism. Christ's example of baptism. This is important. This is a great passage to turn to when trying to explain baptism. You were talking a little bit before service about the milk of the Word, right? Well, this is a milk of the Word. What's baptism about? About how should we do it? Well, it's, you know, Jesus showed us exactly how to do it, and it's pretty straightforward. Verse 13, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now. For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. So we see here the example of Christ's baptism. Well, the first thing we need to learn about baptism is that it is an act of obedience. It has nothing to do with your salvation. Baptism does not get you saved, right? There are other sermons have been preached about that. But we notice here that there had to be some willingness for, for, for this to happen, right? That, that, that baptism is showing that you have an obedient spirit or an obedient heart. First of all, Jesus had to be willing to submit himself to this and go and be baptized, right? But also, John had to be willing to baptize. So there's, we see on both parts, there's this willingness to be obedient to fulfill the command of baptism. I'll read you Acts chapter 2, where the Bible reads, Now when they had heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the met apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and receive the, Holy, the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now Peter is not saying here, get saved. What Peter is saying here is, get saved, get baptized, and you shall receive the Holy Ghost. So there is a particular, you know, they're, they're, that's something that they, sh they shall do. This is what they are commanded to do. So baptism is a command that requires obedience on the part of the person being baptized. Now there's a particular method of baptizing. And I know sometimes, you know, forgive the pun, this gets to be a dry subject, but here's the thing. Baptists in his, throughout history have died for this doctrine. People have been drowned in lakes, burned at the stake, torn asunder. I mean, people have died over the doctrine of baptism. Because when you were living in a time and in a, in a place where the Catholic Church is teaching people that they have to be sprinkled and receive the sacraments in order to go to heaven, and they're just wielding power over, over the common folks, you know, that was something, this was a hard stance to take. I mean, we kind of take it for granted today that we can just go knock an Episcopalian's or, or a Catholic's door or a Lutheran's door and say, hey, baptism is by immersion. Nah, 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 poo -poo. you can't do nothing about it. You know, but there was a time when that would have been heresy, they would have ripped out your tongue. I mean, that kind of thing happened to people who believe this doctrine. So whenever someone starts talking about a doctrine, even though, like, baptism, it's a milk of the word, understand that there's a lot of blood that's been shed over this doctrine right here. <clears throat> There is a particular method of baptizing. The Bible says in verse 16, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. Now, if you're going to come out of something, that means you have to go in. So we see that baptism is by immersion. I mean, how else do you explain it? So we believe as Baptists that baptism is by full immersion. It's not by sprinkling. It's not by the ladle on the head. <laughs> and it's done to adults. I'm just thinking about that crazy video I saw on Facebook yeah. of that oh, of that Greek Orthodox just taking that infant like oh, just throwing that kid in and out just like whiplash. I mean, don't you have any kids, dude? I thought the Greek Orthodox were able to marry and have children. Like I could see a Catholic priest not understanding that a baby has, you know, is very fragile. But I was just like blown away by that, you know. But uh, anyway. It says he came up out of the water. Well, you know, well that's just one verse. I mean, how can you take that one verse and say baptism is by immersion? Well, how about the fact that in John 3, it says that John was baptizing in Anon near, Salem, near to Salem because there was much water there. I mean, if, if, if baptism is, isn't by immersion, if I get sprinkled, I can just I can sprinkle just dozens of you with this bottle. 
I mean, I could just sprinkle, you're baptized, you're baptized, you're baptized. I mean, I wouldn't even the bottle, I could just hot day wipe my sweat, you're baptized, you're baptized. I mean, it would be that easy. But John understood that baptism was by full immersion. That was the example that he set for us. So he had to go where there was much water because all, all of Judea was gathered unto him, right? He was baptizing people. So he couldn't just show up with a bucket and a ladle and just baptize everybody. He had to be where there was a lot of water. What about, you know, in Acts 8? That's another great scripture. Acts, you don't have to turn there, but Acts 8.35, if you want to look at some verses on baptism. It says there, and, and Philip opened his mouth and began to say scripture and preached unto him as Jesus. This is, of course, the Ethiopian eunuch. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What did hinder me to be baptized? I mean, do you think these guys are journeying through the desert on their way back to Ethiopia with no water? I mean, you could, have, you could have said, hand me that camel skin. I baptize in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost. Right? You could have just sprinkled them right there. But he said, hey, look, here's some water. And we know this is also great as it probably shows us that, that Peter took the time to explain baptism to his convert. Which is, I think, something we all as soul winners can work on. Saying, hey, I'm glad you're saved. The next step is baptism and joining a local church. And trying to encourage people to take the next step in fulfilling the Great Commission. To teach them all things. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Holy Ghost. It's not just preaching the gospel. That's a big part of it. Of course, that's the primary thing that comes first. But the other part of it is the fact that we have to be baptizing our converts and teaching them all things whatsoever Christ has commanded us. Amen. Amen. So he says, See here is water, what doth hinder me be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. So we see again a great example in Scripture that salvation comes before baptism. That means that little baby that was getting thrashed around by the Greek Orthodox priest, you know, he's going to have to get saved and get baptized again. And hopefully this doesn't allow like traumatize him a bit. Like some Baptist preacher's like, hey, we gotta baptize you. And he's just gonna go into shock and the PTSD or something and think about and it's getting trashed. I mean, they probably get you nightmares, right? So it's not like that. I mean, I like to see that priest do that with a full grown man, you know, kind of throw him around like that. But he says, Hey, if you believe, you may. You know, if you get back, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you get baptized. That's the only prerequisite. You know, he didn't say, well, here, here's a book on baptism. I'd like you to show up to church, uh, you know, 45 minutes early, and we'll have a little, we'll have a two-week, you know, uh, we'll have a, for the next month and a half or two weeks or whatever, we'll have a little discourse about baptism, and we'll explain to you, you know, and we'll go over our church constitution and our church doctrine, and we'll see about getting enrolled, we'll talk to the deacon board. I mean, people, these Baptists, they put all these prerequisites on baptism. The only one we see in Scripture is that you get saved, that you believe with all your heart. So you can baptize somebody immediately after getting saved. <clears throat> and he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, right? Both Philip the eunuch and he baptized them and they were come up out of the water. So again, we see baptism is by going down into the water and coming up out of the water. It's by full immersion. <clears throat> you see, when we obey God in baptism, it's pleasing to the Father. Look at verse 16 in Matthew 3. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove upon him, and, and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. I mean, isn't that what we want to have said of us? When we love the fact that our Heavenly Father would look down as he did his own Son, as we are his sons also in Christ, if we're born again, that he would look down on us as his children and say, I am well pleased with you? What's well, going to take obedience? It's going to have to say, I'm going to, I'm going to keep the commandments of God. I'm going to obey what the book says. Not just in baptism, but in our standards of living and, 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 and obedience, the other things that Christ has commanded us. Preaching the gospel, you know, keep getting sin out of our life, all these other areas, you know, that take that are make up the Christian life. Being obedient in, in, in whatsoever things he has commanded us. That would be a great thing, wouldn't it? To know that our Father is looking down and saying, I am well pleased, my son. But it takes obedience, doesn't it, before that to happen. You see, God is pleased with us when we are obedient to His commands. That's why it says in Colossians 1, I'll read for you, it says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and desire that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding that He might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. That was Paul's prayer. And that's, that's the prayer that we should all have for one another. That we would all walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Pleasing Him. Being fruitful in every good work. And increasing in the knowledge of God. That's the Christian life. Pleasing God. Obeying the commandments. Being fruitful. Going out and doing the soul winning. 
and teaching our conference about you know, the things of God and being baptized and attending church and increasing the knowledge of God, being able to take the Word of God and teach and preach it to others and edify the body. Moving on there, another thing we can see here that I have to point out is that the Trinity is represented in Christ's baptism. We see the Trinity there, don't we? We see the Spirit of God, right? The Holy Spirit descending in bodily form like a dove upon Him and lighting upon Him. We see the voice from heaven calling Him His Son, making the voice from heaven the Father, and we see the Son Himself being baptized. Amen. So you see the Holy Ghost, you see the Father, and you see the Son. Amen. You see all three of them all present in the same place at the same time. All three God, but all three distinct individuals. Amen. That's the Trinity. By the way, that seems like it's a milk of the word doctrine, doesn't it? It's about as easy as baptism to understand. <clears throat> you see a voice from heaven. I kind of want to close on this thought because whenever I read this passage, it always amazes me. And I always wonder, you know, what that sight, because it says the heavens were opened unto him. You know, and I wonder, was John able to see the things that Christ saw? Was he able to see heaven opened unto him? I mean, what a what a just a glorious sight that must have been. And I wonder that John, if, did he hear that same voice? I, and I believe that he did. That he heard that same voice speaking of his son, saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. You know, that, what a powerful thing that is to see that in Scripture. What a powerful thing that John was able to witness. I mean, life-changing. Just, I mean, it, you can't, just thinking about it sends chills up my spine. Yeah. What an amazing thing to have seen and heard. And we would love to experience that, wouldn't we? We would love to be there and hear the voice of God speaking with the heavens opened and think, wow, what a thrill. But I want to say to you today that that same voice still speaks to us Amen. right there in that book. That we can open up that book and still hear that same voice from heaven speak to us. That's amazing. Amen. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 2, Have not I written unto thee excellent things? We would love to hear that voice from heaven, those excellent things, but we can't right there in the Bible. That's why we should pray and ask God, you know, we want to behold that wondrous sight of heaven open. You know, what a, what a sight that must have been. But maybe we could open up this book and pray and ask God, as the psalmist did, open mine eyes, then I might behold wondrous things out of thy law. I mean, we can peer into heaven right here in this book. We can hear the very voice of God speak to us right through this book. That's an amazing thing. Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer.